Suicide of the West. An Essay on the Meaning and Destiny of Liberalism. James Burnham. Chapter 15, Liberalism versus Reality. Liberalism is not equipped to meet and overcome the actual challenges confronting Western civilization in our time. In its historical practice as well as its ideological doctrine, liberalism has always operated most naturally as a tendency of opposition to the prevailing order, to the status quo, the ancien regime, the establishment in general or in its several parts. Liberalism has always stressed change, reform, the break with encrusted habit whether in the form of old ideas, old customs or old institutions. Thus liberalism has been and continues to be primarily negative in its impact on society, and in point of fact it is through its negative and destructive achievements that liberalism makes its best claim to historical justification. In post-Renaissance Western society there were a number of deeply embedded features that were bad on just about all counts, and were, moreover, capable of being eliminated. To get rid of such features, an attitude of skepticism toward custom and tradition, a fondness for change, and a confidence or even overconfidence in the possibilities of human nature were useful and probably necessary. Liberalism expressed that attitude and felt that confidence. Under its banner, reform movements labored successfully to do away with many of the features of the old society or to transform them beyond recognition, many of the bad features, and also of course some of the good features, because liberalism's impulse to tinker with the established order is quite general, and does not stop with this particular feature that we might all agree needs replacement. Some of the older ways of handling lesser crimes and misdemeanors, for example, were surely barbarous. Torture to secure confessions, hanging for petty thefts, floggings, long prison sentences for minor derelictions, with the sentences almost equivalent to death because of the hideous nature of the jails, the futile and really absurd practice of imprisonment for debt, liberalism had a good deal to do with mitigating these barbarities. And for its humane negative accomplishments to that end liberalism deserves and gets nearly universal approval. Even in this matter of crime and punishment, though, we should notice that liberalism has not done so well when it has tried to go on from the elimination of past abuses to the constructive job of devising new ways to meet the old conditions that do not disappear because of a change in the methods of dealing with them. Liberalism, applying its usual remedies of education and democratic reform seasoned with optimism concerning human nature, has signally failed to get rid of crime and criminals, or even to lessen the frequency of their occurrence. Liberalism even fosters new sorts of crime through its permissive approach to education and discipline and its provocative egalitarianism, some at least of our fearfully multiplying juvenile delinquency is the logical outcome of liberal principles. In a way, a juvenile delinquent is a youth who takes literally the progressive educational stress on self-expression and freedom. Nor is our high percentage of multiple offenders much of an endorsement of the liberal schemes for re-educating criminals and giving them plenty of social service along with easy paroles. I have yet to read the account of one of those terrible crimes of sex perversion that take place daily, wherein the savage who rapes and strangles the child or grandmother or both did not have a long record of offenses which in pre-liberal days would have kept him behind solid bars. Pareto remarks that he doesn't much care what theory of punishment people prefer, so long as they are willing to try to keep murderers, thugs and rapists off the streets. We could make a similar double entry concerning liberalism's past performance in relation to the social position of women, poor laws, abuses in the factory system, electoral practices, business frauds and monopolies, and many other such matters of large and small import that liberalism has been influential in curing a number of wrongs and grave abuses, and that liberalism has been less successful, has often very dismally failed, in its efforts to construct new procedures and institutions to deal with the perennial problems. And in general, liberalism is better out of power than in power, better at changing than preserving, better at destroying than building. Am I repeating old cliches? We need liberals to push through the necessary reforms, and conservatives to make the reforms work, that sort of thing. Yes, I readily admit so, and I have great respect, I will add, for many of the old clichés. The plain, platitudinous, common-sense opinion is very often the true opinion, stripped down to essentials. And in this case the platitude is manifestly true, 
whether we test it by history or by the analysis of ideas. The guilt that is always part of the liberal syndrome swells painfully when liberals gain power and find that the world's sorrows show no tendency to vanish at their sovereign touch. Liberals are uncomfortable, uneasy, when they become, the establishment, we took note earlier of the desperate lengths to which academic liberals go to prove to themselves that they are nonconformists, even on a faculty every member of which has been formed in the same ideological pod. Liberalism's inaptitude for power bears directly on the crucial fact, that the primary issue before Western civilization today, and before its member nations, is survival. No one threatened the survival of the West in AD 1100, the Crusades were an aggression, not a defense, of the West. No one threatened Western survival in 1500 or 1700 or even so short a time ago in the scale of civilizations as the beginning of this century. But now the threat is present, a clear, immediate and sufficient danger, both from within and from without. Before our time, it was a matter, for the West, of consolidation, growth, adaptation, change, reform, improvement, now it is, first of all and condition of all the rest, survival. Liberalism, and the ideas, sentiments and values to which liberalism gives priority, are not well designed for the stark issue of survival. Modern liberalism, in this differing from the classical liberalism of the mid-19th century, stands for all-out anti-colonialism, which follows from its emotional bent and value system as well as from its principles. Imperialism of all sorts, and especially imperialism administered by governments of capitalist nations, is wrong, modern liberalism holds, and all colonies, dependencies, subject nations and peoples ought to become free, self-governing, independent states, with seat and vote in the United Nations. The liberal belief in anti-colonialism prevails in all Western nations except Portugal. In the former imperialist powers, the ascendancy of anti-colonialism is a mixed result in which the pressure of colonial revolt has supplemented the spread of liberal ideology. In the United States, which has had a less direct relation to the practical colonial struggle, the anti-colonial attitude is more purely ideological, though its content derives from circumstances of the national history as well as from modern liberalism. In any case, the United States by choice, and all but one of the Western European nations by a combination of choice and coercion, are against colonialism anywhere and everywhere, and in historical fact all but a remnant of Western colonialism has disappeared during these post-war years. But in this actual world we live in, which in the matter of colonialism as in so much else differs so notably from the world of ideology, ousting colonial rule often means destroying the only significant element of social responsibility, as has repeatedly and vainly been demonstrated by ex-colonies in Asia and Africa, and will be more fiercely demonstrated in the years soon to come. Many of the problems of Latin America overlap those of colonialism. Liberalism, and the United States government under the spell of liberal doctrine, are against all Latin American dictators, especially the dictators of the right, against them even if for a passing while they must be dealt with, and also against the political, economic and social role of the church, the army, the big landlords and the business oligarchs. Since these four groups oppose many of the reforms that liberalism believes universally obligatory. But in most of the Latin American countries, when the influence of these four social forces is destroyed or much weakened, as the Alliance for Progress program avowedly aims to do, only a social vacuum remains. The liberals have no replacement for the structure they have so enthusiastically helped to tear down. The vacuum is filled first by chaotic social churning and then, if a qualified dictator doesn't come along to pick up the pieces, quite probably by communism, which does have a method, a will and an apparatus to bring about a reconsolidation on a new foundation. This indicates why the communist and liberal programs agree on most of their negative or destructive proposals. From the communist point of view, the liberal program is the communist program at a preliminary stage in the dialectical unfolding of the revolution. All ideologies at every stage in their careers distort reality in some degree, but in its youth and prime a major ideology remains closely enough in touch with the social world from which it has sprung to permit it to inspire and guide effective and sometimes creative action. This was the case with the older liberalism of the 19th century and the early years of our own. 
but the liberal ideology has by now got so far out of touch with fact that through its lens it has become impossible to see reality, much less to act positively on reality. Most of the categories of modern liberalism no longer correspond to anything in the world of space and time, they are mythical creatures on an Olympus much farther out in empty space than the residents of the ancient gods, who never lost their habit of frequently touching down on earth. The liberal flight from reality is headlong, on every front. It could not have a purer, or sillier, symbol than the multiplication in this country of rules that prohibit the designation of race or color on many sorts of license, document, record and statistic, a classic instance of the attempt to substitute a satisfying self-generated dream world for a distasteful reality. It is just as silly, of course, to discuss peace with communists, to expect civilized statesmanship from tribal chiefs, or to imagine you can stop the clock of scientific technology by signing test ban agreements. What are the crucial present challenges to Western civilization? There are a hundred challenges, certainly, large and small, but let us narrow down to the challenges that clearly and immediately and powerfully threaten actual survival. These do not include, contrary to ritual liberal insistence, mere hunger and poverty. Hunger and poverty are nothing novel and nothing special, in themselves they pose no peculiar problems that haven't been posed a thousand times before. The poor, we were told by a source that the pre-liberal West was once prepared to believe, we have always with us. The crucial present challenges are, I believe, three, first, the jungle now spreading within our own society, in particular in our great cities, second, the explosive population growth and political activization within the world's backward areas, principally the equatorial and sub-equatorial latitudes occupied by non-white masses, third, the drive of the communist enterprise for a monopoly of world power. Looking through the glass of liberalism it is impossible, I repeat, even to see these challenges clearly. And liberalism apart, it cannot be easy for people like the author and most readers of this book, who lead, whether aware of it or not, lives carefully sheltered from social horrors, to comprehend the reality of our domestic jungles. Strained headlines thrust it on our attention, but the mechanical repetitions of sensationalist journalism have come to seem almost as meaningless as a TV serial. Now and then I get a frontline report from some unknown correspondent who has happened to read something I have written, like one who wrote from Philadelphia not long after the 1960 election campaign. In Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, the jungle is called just that, the jungle. The Kennedys and the Nixons and the other out-of-touch young men believe that we must go on civil writing our civilization to death. But they don't know what is happening to the people. I am referring to the little people who ride the buses and streetcars and subways, the little people who put up with muggings, rapings, beatings, stabbings and murderings, the little people who, when the criminals are caught, are told that as culturally handicapped victims of society the criminals had every justification for committing their crimes. As a man who lives among and is one of these little people, I can aver that the common topic of discussion, just as surely as the sun rises and sets every day, at lodge meetings and sports gatherings and family get-togethers is the increasing savagery of the savages among us. Almost always someone present has been a victim of a savage attack, or has a relative or neighbor who has been a victim. Last week I heard one cynical neighbor say, we're in more danger than the pioneers ever were. When night fell, they closed the gates of the stockade. They knew the savages were outside. Nowadays when night falls, we know we've got them roaming around inside with us. What's worse, they are armed, and we're not. And worst of all, one of them is caught attacking a woman and a civil liberties lawyer gets him off. The woman victim is maligned by the lawyer as being little better than a prostitute, while the arresting cop is lucky if he gets off without losing his job. A woman named Marjorie K. McGoldrick, who might have been any of a million others, wrote the New York Herald Tribune, October 20, 1962, about the nation's largest and the world's richest city as she was acquainted with it. Recently our police commissioner, Michael J. Murphy, went on record with the statement that there is no reign of terror in New York. Anyone who has eyes which are even drowsily opened for one twentieth of an inch knows that there is no tranquility in most parts of this city. Take for example the recent experiences of the occupants of a five-story building containing six apartments on Riverside Drive between 79th and 80th Streets. 1. A man from the first floor was coming home around 1am and was mugged at the outside entrance door. 
Two, on the fourth floor a girl and her friend were sitting in the living room one evening when they were suddenly surprised by an intruder who threatened their lives if they didn't cover their heads and toss out their wallets. Three, a girl on the fifth floor came home one evening to find her apartment burglarized and a number of valuable things missing. Four, another evening the police were looking for a man on the roof, and later it was found that several windows in the building had been entered, including those of the same fourth and fifth floor apartments aforementioned, with many things stolen from the fourth floor. Five, several days ago the two apartments on the fifth floor were entered, one of them for the third time, and a number of things were taken, with locks jammed and other locks completely broken. Also, two girls in a building nearby were raped recently and in another building burglaries occur about once a week. Do the enumerated occurrences not constitute a reign of terror? Or just what kind of pretty term can be substituted? Each time something happened police came, and each time the attitude was one of helplessness and resignation, that this is something which happens every day, is to be expected, and that there is not much to be done about it. Time, March 22, 1963, began a description of the condition of the capital city of the leading nation of Western civilization. Muggers attack in broad daylight. Churches lock their doors because, as one clergyman explains, too many bums come in, wander around and take what they like. Last week a purse snatcher was shot to death by a rookie policeman, a 40-year-old man was beaten to death in his home with a leg wrench by a couple of intruders from his end table, a bank was robbed and police pursued the bandits through the streets while passers-by scattered to escape the gunfire. History has a remarkable way of providing striking visual symbols of what is really going on, that tell us much more than the pretentious statistics of the sociologists. In the parks of our great cities, exactly as in all jungles, honest men may no longer move at night, when the sun goes down they must stay near the fires, while the beasts prowl. In those dark jungles and along the jungle paths into which the night transforms so many city streets, huge dogs now join the few hunters still on trail. What have dogs, killer dogs, move over, to do with men? But dogs are of course appropriate companions in hunting the beasts of the jungle. For the liberal ideology, the domestic jungles are the merely temporary byproducts of a lack of education and faulty social institutions, to be cleared up by urban renewal programs, low rents, high minimum wages and integrated schools, in which regulations forbid physical discipline, expulsion or failing to certify every student to the next higher grade each year. The backward regions of the equatorial zones are only, for liberalism, enlarged slums that will be put to rights by the standard remedies, education, democracy, and welfare in the special form of foreign aid. It is impossible for liberalism, or liberals, to face a truth that is perhaps too terrible for any secular ideology to face, that, with only minor exceptions, there is no chance whatever to cure the hunger, poverty and wretchedness of these two billion human beings in the foreseeable future, that these conditions will, on average, much more probably worsen than improve even in small measure. Liberalism cannot either see or deal with the domestic jungle and the backward regions, the two challenges are closely similar. Liberalism is unfitted by its rationalistic optimism, its permissiveness, its egalitarianism and democratism, and by its guilt. Consider once more the logic of liberalism in relation to the backward regions, bringing it to bear on the question of survival. From the universalism and democratism of the liberal ideology there follows, as we saw, the familiar one-man, one-vote principle of which so much has lately been made. The United States Supreme Court explicitly affirmed it in its March 18, 1963 decision on the Georgia voting case. This principle implies, by simple arithmetic, the subjugation of the West, the members of Western civilization are a small minority, it is as simple as that. The economic egalitarianism of the liberal ideology implies, as we also saw, the reduction of Westerners to hunger and poverty. Of course liberals hide these implications from themselves and from Western public opinion. They dream up some sort of world democracy in which a reasonable world society uses the one man, one vote principle to achieve universal freedom, peace and justice, and economic egalitarianism means plenty for all. But that is ideological fantasy. It is the subjugation, or disappearance, of the West, and Western, indeed, universal, hunger and poverty that are the unavoidable end terms of the logic of liberalism. 
Naturally this logic is not carried out, or has not yet been carried out, all the way in practice. But in the soul of liberalism, and in the Western civilization that liberalism has permeated, this logic works like a spiritual worm, corrupting the will of the West to survive as a distinctive historical entity, easing the dissolution of the West into the distinctionless human mass. It could not be otherwise. In this case the liberal knows he is guilty, and his guilt is not a mere subjective sentiment. It is a fact that the liberals of the affluent society, by not yielding their power and privileges more fully and more quickly, are guilty, guilty, precisely, of betraying their own principles. There is only one way to escape the conclusions from these logical deductions, by rejecting at least some of the principles from which the deductions start. There would have to be a rejection, in particular, of the quantitative reduction of human beings to common man, and a reassertion of qualitative distinctions. Quite specifically, there would have to be reasserted the pre-liberal conviction that Western civilization, thus Western man, is both different from and superior in quality to other civilizations and non-civilizations, from whatever source that difference and superiority are derived or acquired. And there would have to be a renewed willingness, legitimized by that conviction, to use superior power and the threat of power to defend the West against all challenges and challengers. Unless Western civilization is superior to other civilizations and societies, it is not worth defending, unless Westerners are willing to use their power, the West cannot be defended. But by its own principles, liberalism is not allowed to entertain that conviction or to make frank, unashamed and therefore effective use of that power. It is the challenge of the communist enterprise that most clearly, directly and immediately threatens Western survival. How clearly may be shown by an elementary extrapolation. If communism continues to advance at the rate it has in fact maintained since it began operating as a distinct organization in 1903, it will achieve its goal of world power before the end of this century, well before that, indeed, because the continuing advance of communism, combined with Western withdrawals from regions not yet communized, would throw the world's strategic balance decisively in favor of the communist enterprise some time before the direct extension of its rule over all the world. In fact, there are many indications that the communist high command believes that point to have been reached and passed already. The challenge of communism is from the left, and all the major challenges that now bear crucially on survival come from the left. But liberalism, as we have seen in some detail, is unable to conduct an intelligent, firm and sustained struggle against the left. Liberalism can function effectively only against the right. Jules Monorat, one of the most remarkable writers on the really serious issues of our time, summed up some years ago the West's discouraging dilemma in the fight against communism, the left is infected with it, and the right cannot understand it. Liberalism is infected with communism in the quite precise sense that communism and liberalism share most of their basic axioms and principles, and many of their values and sentiments. In terms of theoretical principle, it is only what remains in modern liberalism of the older individualistic doctrine that sharply differentiates liberalism from communism. The secular, historically optimistic, reformist, welfare statish, even the plebiscitary aspects of liberalism are all present in communism. Liberals and communists are, most of the time, against the same things and persons, whether Franco or McCarthy, the Chamber of Commerce or the John Birch Society, colonialism or the House Committee on Un-American Activities, big landlords or segregated schools, Chambe or Arlie Burke, D.M. or Chang or J. Edgar Hoover. They have the same enemies, and the choice of the enemy is the decisive act in determining the nature of political struggle. What communism does is to carry the liberal principles to their logical and practical extreme, the secularism, the rejection of tradition and custom, the stress on science, the confidence in the possibility of molding human beings, the determination to reform all established institutions, the goal of wiping out all social distinctions, the internationalism, the belief in the welfare state carried to its ultimate form in the totalitarian state. The liberals' arm cannot strike with consistent firmness against communism, either domestically or internationally, because the liberal dimly feels that in doing so he would be somehow wounding himself. Though the principles of liberalism and communism thus largely overlap in the abstract, communism gives them an altogether different historical content, 
and communism differs from liberalism even more grossly in the methods it employs. Communists are serious, historically serious one might say, in a sense that liberals can neither be nor understand. Liberals cannot believe it when the communists say that they propose to establish a world federation of Soviet socialist republics, when they pledge that they will bury us, when they frankly state that they will use any means to accomplish their ends, liberalism cannot believe that every domestic communist is committed on principle to treason. Liberalism cannot help seeing the communists in the mirror of its own doctrine about human nature and motivation, as sharing, fundamentally, the same interests and goals, in particular the goals of peace and universal well-being. Inevitably, therefore, liberalism tries to meet the challenge of communism by means of the approved procedures that follow from liberal principles, plenty of talk and free speech, negotiations, as talk between nations is called, the appeal to man's better side, his rationality and supposed common interests in peace, disarmament and a lift in the general standard of living, reduction of tensions. Avoidance of risky confrontations, exchange and truth programs to prove to the communists the goodness of our intentions, reform and economic improvement for everybody in the world, in short, peaceful coexistence phasing into appeasement and collaboration. The communists, since they are serious and since they are irrevocably fixed on their goal of a monopoly of world power, simply turn the liberal-inspired overtures into additional weapons to further their own advance. Shut off from reality by their ideological wall, liberals draw no conclusion from the obvious and frequently documented fact that in every negotiation ever conducted between the communist and non-communist nations, the majority and often the entirety of concessions have always come from the non-communist side, the net political and strategic profit has always gone to the communists. The years-long negotiations on a nuclear test ban provide a textbook case for a rule that has no exceptions. Because the communists are serious, they will have to be stopped, not by getting educated by liberals, the communists know very well what they are doing, but by superior power and will. Just possibly we shall not have to die in large numbers to stop them, but we shall certainly have to be willing to die. But modern liberalism does not offer ordinary men compelling motives for personal suffering, sacrifice and death. There is no tragic dimension in its picture of the good life. Men become willing to endure, sacrifice and die for God, family, king, honor, country, from a sense of absolute duty or an exalted vision of the meaning of history. It is such traditional ideals and the institutions slowly built around them that are in present fact the great bulwarks, spiritual as well as social, against the tidal advance of the world communist enterprise. And it is precisely these ideals and institutions that liberalism has criticized, attacked and in part overthrown as superstitious, archaic, reactionary and irrational. In their place liberalism proposes a set of pale and bloodless abstractions, pale and bloodless for the very reason that they have no roots in the past, in deep feeling and in suffering. Except for mercenaries, saints and neurotics, no one is willing to sacrifice and die for progressive education, Medicare, humanity in the abstract, the United Nations or a 10% rise in social security payments. Thus, in relation to the struggle against the communist enterprise, the principles of modern liberalism point inexorably toward the conclusion that has been brought to the surface by the younger people in the pacifist and disarmament movements, better read than dead. Once again it is a cliché that goes to the heart of the matter. Unless the members of Western civilization, above all the members of its governing and intellectual elites, are convinced, convinced inwardly and absolutely, of the exact opposite, better dead than read, then their children are most certainly going to be read, those of them who are not first dead too, for good measure. There are, thus, specific features of liberal doctrine and habit that explain, in each case, liberalism's demonstrated inability to meet the primary challenges to Western survival. The deficiency can also be related, as I have already suggested, to a more general trait, to the fact that liberalism cannot come to terms with power, in particular with force, the most direct expression of power. It is not that liberals, when they enter the governing class, or when they constitute a revolutionary opposition striving to become the governing class, never make use of force, unavoidably they do, sometimes to excess. But because of their ideology they are not reconciled intellectually and morally to force. 
They therefore tend to use it ineptly, at the wrong times and places, against the wrong targets, in the wrong amounts. In all human societies of any magnitude, states, nations, empires, federations, whatever they may be called, force is an inevitable, therefore normal and natural, ingredient, inevitable both for the preservation of internal order and for defense against external threats. From a practical standpoint, everyone knows this, even liberals, a nation wouldn't survive two hours if all its instrumentalities of force and coercion suddenly disappeared. But though liberals know this insofar as they act in practical affairs, their doctrine does not take account of it. The theoretical recognition and acceptance of the fact that force is integral to the social order presupposes a pessimistic theory of human nature, or at the very least the rejection of any optimistic view. Force is inevitable in society because there are ineradicable limits, defects, evils and irrationalities in human nature, with resultant clashes of egos and interests that cannot be wholly resolved by peaceful methods of rational discussion, education, example, negotiation and compromise. Understanding this, and admitting it, a magistrate will include force in his equations, and will plan in advance how and when to use it effectively, and if he is responsible and reasonably humane, the result may be that a minimum of actual force will be used in practice. But the liberal is prevented by his ideology from admitting the necessary and integral role of force, and by his temperament he dislikes to plan consciously ahead concerning the ways and means of using force. Moreover, most liberals, as we noted, are foxes rather than lions. They belong to the types, professions and classes who seek their ends by shrewdness, manipulations and verbal skills. What tends to happen, therefore, when liberals become influential or dominant in the conduct of a nation's affairs is that the government tries to handle the difficulties, dangers, issues and threats it faces by those same methods, as Pareto observed in the quotation we earlier considered, and to shy away as much as possible and as long as possible from the use of force. In fact, the liberals tend to employ the social agencies of force, police and army, as above all instruments of bluff. Their actual use of force, which will always be necessary no matter what the theory, becomes erratic and unpredictable, the result not of a prudent estimate of the objective situation but of their own impatience, panic or despair. This happens in both internal and external relations. In the United States, for example, minority groupings such as trade unions and, more lately, Negroes have incorporated force among their methods. Under the influence of liberal ideas and persons, the authorities have for the past generation or so tried to omit the use of counterforce, and to meet the issues by diversionary maneuvers into bargaining rooms and courts, by manipulating public opinion by offering compromises, and so on. But every now and then the conduct of a minority grouping gets so outrageous, or so nearly touches some public right or sovereignty, that direct counterforce must be brought into the game. The police get out their clubs, tear gas and sometimes guns to stop a union's reign of terror, open up the public highways, or prevent intimidation of governors or lawmakers. But against the background of the pervasive liberal rhetoric and the usual liberal practice in these matters, the appearance of drawn weapons on the scene seems sudden and arbitrary. If strikers or demonstrators get beaten up or thrown in jail, it is the cops and the authorities who seem by the inner logic of liberalism to be the villainous aggressors. And the final outcome is likely to be considerably more blood and bitterness than if a small number of heads had been knocked somewhat earlier on. In the Kennedy-Johnson administration, liberals, among them ideologues of the first rank, have had a greater voice in international policy than in any previous government of the United States, and it is not surprising that as a consequence the use of force in connection with international affairs has never been so awkward. As a matter of fact, the entire theory of deterrence as held at present by official United States opinion, mostly worked out in the largely liberal-staffed think factories, is nothing but a gigantic bluff the purpose of the entire strategic nuclear force is not at all to be used, if that were included in even the possible purpose, a first strike echelon, presently excluded, would be part of the strategic force, but merely to make the other side think you might conceivably use it. But the awkwardness is more plainly evident in critical episodes that keep arising in one continent after another. Cuba is of course the prime example. In most of the world, 
including all the communist countries, the way in which the force available to the United States was mishandled in the Bay of Pigs invasion was quite beyond comprehension. I happened to be in Manila, and I vividly recall how, when an American semi-official friend and I paid a visit to the floor of the legislature on the critical morning, we were surrounded by fifty or sixty gesticulating members who dismissed the published news as obvious nonsense and demanded to know how quickly the island would be taken. As was later revealed, and could be readily deduced at the time, the liberal ideologues were the dominant influence on the policy then followed. It was not that they forswore the use of force, that would have been a decision which, whether correct or not, could certainly be defended. What was so remarkable was that they used just enough force to assure the worst possible result from all possible points of view. It goes without saying that men serious about force, and understanding its functions, would have brought to bear, once they had joined that issue, all the force necessary to finish it. Laos, Katanga and South Vietnam provide other typical examples. In Laos the United States made available to the anti-communist government insufficient force to deal with the path at Lao but just enough to wreck relations between the anti-communists and the neutralists, and then withdrew force from the anti-communists in favor of a compromise that guaranteed continuing conflict in Laos itself and permitted the communists to give uninhibited support to their fighting comrades in South Vietnam. In Katanga, the policy of the United Nations Command, so far as the use of force went, was wholly dependent on the decisions of the United States to the extent that the United States chose to decide anything, and in this case conspicuously, as in the case of Cuba, United States policy was the product of the liberal ideologues. Perhaps it was correct to compel Chambe to knuckle under to the central government. But there has seldom been a more ludicrous spectacle than the eccentric, undirected, sporadic, on-again-off-again -again use of driblets of force to accomplish that end, with the not unnatural consequence of contributing mightily to the political, social and economic disintegration of that young nation. The force used in South Vietnam is considerably greater, but no less unsurely and inconsistently applied. It is enough to keep the country in a turmoil and to make sure that a good many people, among them Americans, get killed, but not enough, and not used properly, to defeat the communists. It should not be inferred from examples such as these that liberals never turn to the all-out use of force, merely that they seldom turn to the right amount of force at the right time. It was the liberals who were loudest in demanding war against Hitler, and who invented both the idea and slogan of unconditional surrender, and it was a liberal, though he numbered communists among his advisers, who called for the pastoralization of Germany. And it is not inconceivable that a liberal, in a state of panic that cuts through his ideological cover, may press the button that begins a nuclear exchange. Nor is it impossible that a governing stratum of liberals might reach the conclusion that a generalized internal use of force is the only way to assure their prescribed society of peace, justice, well-being and freedom. Georges Sorel, in his study of social violence, warned that, the optimist in politics is an inconstant and even dangerous man because he takes no account of the great difficulties presented by his projects. If he possesses an exalted temperament, and if unhappily he finds himself armed with great power, permitting him to realize the ideal he has fashioned, the optimist may lead his country into the worst disasters. He is not long in finding out that social transformations are not brought about with the ease that he had counted on, he then supposes that this is the fault of his contemporaries, instead of explaining what actually happens by historical necessities, he is tempted to get rid of people whose obstinacy seems to him to be so dangerous to the happiness of all. During the terror, the men who spilt most blood were precisely those who had the greatest desire to let their equals enjoy the golden age they had dreamt of, and who had the most sympathy with human wretchedness, optimists, idealists, and sensitive men, the greater desire they had for universal happiness the more inexorable they showed themselves.